Hi, my name's Alan Sens, and I'm sitting outside the First Nations House of Learning here at the University of British Columbia. Welcome to the Global Politics Instructional Video Series. In this series, we're looking at a number of key concepts relevant to the study of international relations and global politics. And today, we're looking at nuclear deterrence. Now, the whole idea of deterrence predates nuclear weapons. It's a very old concept. And the basic idea of deterrence is you're trying to prevent someone from attacking you. You're trying to prevent an attack or deter an attack on yourself. Whether you as an individual, or you as a group of people, or you as a state country. Now, originally, most deterrence was achieved by denial. That is to say, an attempt to deny your possible attacker their objectives. And typically this was achieved through things like building up a big army or building lots of castles and fortifications or walls, this sort of thing. And the whole idea then was to deny your opponent the prospect of an easy victory at a reasonable cost. If by building up a big army and building lots of castles and fortifications, you had made it very difficult for anyone to believe that they could attack you with any chance of success, well, then they wouldn't attack you, right? So the whole idea was they were deterred from attacking you. They wouldn't attack you in the first place. Now this idea of deterrence by denial didn't always work, of course. But the idea was prevent someone from attacking you by making it very expensive to do so and by denying them the possibility of a good chance of victory. Now when nuclear weapons came along, the destructive power of nuclear weapons changed the idea of deterrence quite a bit. Instead of denial, it now became possible to think of deterring someone by the threat of punishment. Specifically, by the threat of inflicting unacceptable damage on them if they did attack you. So essentially, what we were saying during the Cold War was that if you attack me, I will attack you in a way that inflicts so much damage on your country, you couldn't possibly hope to survive. And the logic there was, you would never then be attacked in the first place. An attacker would be deterred because of the threat of punishment. And nuclear weapons being so powerful really made that threat quite credible. So during the Cold War, for example, Nuclear deterrence was one of the key components in this standoff between the United States and the West and the Soviet Union and the so-called East. Let's take a closer look at nuclear deterrence. Okay, nuclear deterrence. Now, the whole idea of nuclear deterrence is it's based on the threat of punishment. You prevent someone from attacking you, and you achieve this by presenting any possible attacker with the prospect of incurring unacceptable damage if they attack you. And so, they won't attack you in the first place. They are deterred. And during the Cold War, this was achieved by the United States and the Soviet Union through the use of increasingly large stockpiles of nuclear weapons. And to illustrate that, I'm just going to draw the United States and the Soviet Union here. Or if you like, country A and country B, if you want to be abstract. So here's the United States, and here is the Soviet Union. And in the early part of the Cold War, both sides had nuclear weapons, but had only bombers to deliver those nuclear weapons. So I'm just going to draw some bombers here. And uh, those are very ugly bombers, but let's just make believe that they're bombers. And the whole idea is that if one side attacked the other, with nuclear weapons, the other side would respond with its nuclear weapons. But it wasn't until really the late 1960s, early 1970s, that both sides started to develop weapon systems called 
Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or if you like, ICBMs. And these ICBMs were based underground, so I'll just draw some silos here. And in each silo was a intercontinental ballistic missile with a nuclear warhead on top, or in some cases, several nuclear warheads on top. And when ICBMs were developed, it actually enhanced the idea of nuclear deterrence and the threat of punishment, because not only were the bombers available, and they, of course, could be shot down, there were now all of these ICBMs. As the Cold War went on, another technology was developed, and they were called SLBMs, submarine-launched ballistic missiles. And these were ICBMs based on submarines. And both the United States and the Soviet Union had these. And these were ICBMs then that could be launched from submarines. So by the mid part of the Cold War, really, both the United States and the Soviet Union had a triad of delivery systems, ICBMs, SLBMs, and bombers. And the whole idea of nuclear deterrence was that if one side decided it was going to attack the other for whatever reason, that attack would be met with a retaliatory response from ICBMs, SLBMs, and bombers. And then the other side presumably would have responded in kind. And you would have this enormous nuclear exchange. Nuclear weapons being launched from various delivery systems against the other side. And by the mid part of the Cold War, both sides had so many delivery systems and so many nuclear weapons they were faced with the prospect that if either side attacked the other and received a retaliatory response, both the United States and the Soviet Union would be destroyed. And this became known as Mutual Assured Destruction, or MAD for short. It was indeed a mad world. If either side attacked the other, the other would be able to respond by inflicting unacceptable damage with nuclear weapons on the other side. And the fact that both the United States and the Soviet Union could do this during the Cold War meant that they were in a mutual hostage situation, a balance of terror, a balance of fear. And so, the argument runs, deterrence. They would not attack each other in the first place. Because going to war meant suicide. It meant suicide, certainly, for the United States and the Soviet Union. It possibly meant suicide for everyone living in the northern hemisphere of the planet. And quite possibly, it meant suicide for human civilization. Okay. So that was nuclear deterrence. Cheery, wasn't it? The reality is, of course, is today, after the Cold War, we don't talk quite as much about nuclear deterrence. At least we don't talk about it in the context of the United States and Russia or the United States and China. Oh, it's still there. All those countries still possess nuclear weapons, as do other countries around the world. But it's not as big a part of the literature or the discussion uh, as it was during the Cold War. Today, though, we do tend to talk about nuclear deterrence in the context of India and Pakistan. Here are two countries that have fought several wars since the end of World War II, and both of them have nuclear weapons. So today, we're more likely to focus on the possibility of a future nuclear war between India and Pakistan. And how do we stop that? Can nuclear deterrence actually play a role in helping prevent that kind of war in the future? I hope you enjoyed this video. Join me again next time.